Can you see now the file, the PDF file? No, we don't see the file. At least I don't. I guess, oh, okay, that's better. Now? Yes, now we okay. can see it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, let, let, I, see, I see some guy here, I want to say happy birthday. I know it's too late. I know we should have met at, in New York, and this is Ofer, very nice to see you. <laughs> I, I was promi promised that I don't age in the coming year until we. Oh, ah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see. You. Okay. Good. So, uh, are you ready? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, good. So, let's start. Um, so, today uh, we are happy to have Jean Dominique Duchel from TU Berlin, who will be talking about aging in the Edward Wilkinson and KPZ Universality classes. Please, Jean Dominique. Okay, so thanks a lot. I must say that I'm completely a Zoom illiterate, and this is the first talk I'm giving, uh, so I will try my best. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I want to make two remarks about this talk. First uh, remark is this project on aging of the Edward Wilkinson model started a long, long time ago. And in fact, it is on the Carmel, when I met Amir in 2001, we were just discussing about an opportunity to, uh, to, for me to spend a sabbatical in Stanford and we met in his apartment in Carmel. The next thing I want to say is the following. The last time I visited Israel, I went to, also I went at the Weizmann Institute, but also was invited to give a talk at Technion and, uh, and Dima Yofi invited me. So, I still remember this and I would like to, well, you know what happened to, to Dima and I'm very sorry about it. Okay, let's start now with the talk. So we're going to look at aging. There are different ways of dealing with aging. And one way of dealing with aging is just to deal with correlation. In other words, we have a stochastic process, Z, ZT, and we would say that it's aging if the following is true, that if you look at correlation at two different times, so Z at time T and at time A T, where A is larger than one, so at later time. So we say that we are aging if the correlation converges to some number, rho of A, A is a parameter here, which is uh, different from zero. Some sense, this is just showing uh, that it takes a long time to get out of equilibrium. So aging was, we will conjecture for a model of the following way, we'll talk more about it, which is called the semi-discrete um, PAM uh, with, with AMIA, this is where we started. But it was also done in experimental way by different people here. And also a prediction was done in more theoretically. I will get to more detail later. Now, in the rig rigorous situation, so again, let's go back to what I want to talk. So we are really dealing about correlation, which is a two time function. This is maybe the challenge in this business. And this was already done by Corbin, Goshal and Hammond in AOP in the so-called narrow A. So this is just for the background. And also for Ferrari and Ocelli in the last passage percolation. Now let's go. Now, what we would like to deal with is a very special case which is called the stationary regime. So let me just tell you what I mean by stationary. Well, we would say that a process is stationary, or in fact, space-time stationary. In fact, what we mean is that when the increments are stationary. In other words, we look at the increments, which is uh, the increment in time and space. So this is t, dt plus s, x plus s minus c, s, y. And this should have the same law as ZT of X. And the, the, the most famous stationary process is, of course, the Brownian motion, if you think about it. It's a stationary time increment. But here we have, a, we say, a process which is both time and space as this property. Now, it turned out, and this is the motivation we have. It turned out that if you know that a process is stationary, then it's very easy to compute the covariance. Remember the challenge in covariance is it's at two different times, but it turned out that you can reduce the covariance to the variance. And this is just what we call the covariance to variance reduction. 
So let's start. So we super, we say that we have uh, covariance to variance reduction. If here we all want to compute actually the covariance at two different locations, so time and location. This is T1, X1, this is T2, X2. And then it turned out that this covariance can be computed as one half the variance of Z T1, X1, plus the variance T2, X2, minus the variance of the increment T2 minus T1, X2 minus X1. So again, what we're showing is that on the left-hand side, we have a covariance at two different times. On the right-hand side, and this is the, the reward, it's only the variance. Okay. And it turned out that this formula is very simple uh, to compute because we first suppose we have a random variable. We want to look at what is the variance of x minus y. Then it is the same as variance of x plus variance of y minus twice the covariance of x, y. Therefore, if you want to solve it as a covariance here, this is the covariance, just one half and you get just immediately this formula. This is quite easy to compute. Now, so again, what I want to say is that as soon as you have a stationarity, then you have the reduction. Why? Because again, in this business here, you can just plug it, uh, plug it, the, uh, the use the stationarity. In fact, so here you see, if you want to compute the variance of the increment here, then it's just of the increment of the process is just the variance of the increment in time and space. So you plug this into the formula and what you pick up here is precisely this here. So let me, let me, uh, let me just recall what we're doing. See? In fact, if you look at this formula, you realize all you need is this, is this equality for the variance. So if you know that the variance of the increment of the process is the variance of the increment in time and space, then you, you get this formula for the variance. We will see, and I will give an example that all you need is this. So the first question you could ask, can you have process for which this is satisfied without stationarity in law? And I will show an example soon. Yes, it can be the case. Okay. So now, why, why, so let me go back. So why is it useful? So uh, we, we want to compute, we have now a formula for the covariance. A nice formula of the covariance. This is very useful because in fact, it's telling you that if you want to deal with asymptotic of covariance, okay, then basically all you care about is about asymptotic of variance in this regime. More precisely, suppose, this is the object we are interested in. Suppose you're interested in the correlation between two different times, a time t and a later time. Then if you plug in the, the formula, so on the, here of course, what we deal with uh, is the variance to covariance formula. So you know that the covariance of this object, the co covariance of this object is one half variance of this plus variance is minus variance of this divided by this. So basically, if you are interested in the asymptotic, what you have to understand is how does the variance behaves as t tends to infinity. Let us, for instance, assume here we just look at location zero. Let us, for instance, assume that if we rescale the process appropriately, so suppose that z bar of t is z of t minus c of t divided by t to the power k, kappa, where kappa is some number. Uh, and we know that the events asymptotically converge to some b which is different from zero, then what you will find out uh, is the following fact. You just plug in, in the formula here. Here, the a becomes a to the power of 2k, the one minus a, a to the minus one to the 2k minus one, divided by uk, this comes from here. And if you know the asymptotic of the variance, you get the following formula that aging takes place. In other words, the limit as t tends to infinity of that object just takes this expression here. So you can see the expression just comes from the stationarity and the scaling property. This is just what we call the aging function, the very explicit aging function. Okay. Good. Now, in particular, if you already know, this is what you would expect. Okay, let me go back. So by the way, you see immediately that this constant here plays no role, there are different kind of object. Correlation is blind to 
if you shift it or if you rescale, so this plays a role. But suppose the process itself uh, had a scaling property. Scaling invariant means that the law of ZAT is the same as AKZT, which is predicted, let's say, by Z bar. Then you don't even have to pass to the limit. You get immediately that, and it's stationary. Then, then you have exactly this formula. Okay, so this looks like quite abstract nonsense, but let's try to see in which situation. Here. By the way, the the interesting fact about this this business here is that you can find like asymptotics. For instance, you would see immediately that when a becomes very small, so when A becomes very small, which is about one, then of course the correlation should go to one. And this is the asymptotic you get. And when A tends to infinity, very large, then it goes to zero. And this is the asymptotic you get. By the way, maybe just to make, I, I should have said this to, so why would you care about aging? Why would people care about it? Well, typically this is an idea that physicists have started with because they have some model which they don't really know which model it is. But what they can do, they can do some measurement. In particular, they can do some easy measurement of correlation. And in some sense, the reason why it is interesting is while experimentally measuring some correlation, they can identify what the model is. So this is one of the motivation of aging. Now, now let's go to so I want now to, to give you, so in some sense, this was just abstract. And let me just give you a couple of processes for which you know that this takes place. And the first class of process, which is just a toy model, and we just did it, in fact, just to learn how to deal with it. This is called the Edward Wilkinson equation. It turned out that a lot of process will be attracted to this universality class. So in some sense, you can write down what is the SPDE associated. It's a very easy SPDE because in some sense, uh, so you have the, the, the partial derivative in time. Here you have just the Laplacian plus space white noise. And now what is important, we start at two-sided Brownian motion. So we're in one dimension. By the way, of course, you could also try to write down an equation similarly in higher dimension, but it turned out that this is pointwise defined, this because dimension one, and it will not be pointwise defined, it will be a distribution in higher dimension. Now, of course, this equation here, you could just write explicitly the solution because it's a linear equation. So all what you do is you just use the semigroup associated with the, uh, with, which is just the, the semigroup of the Brownian motion back on both sides and you can explicitly write down, this is easy to do also. Now it turned out that, that the first claim is that by choosing this initial distribution, which is just uh, the Lebronian motion, it turned out that it's easy to see that we have, uh, we, we have stationarity. We'll show this later. And in fact, what you have is a so-called four to one scaling, which is typical for this universality class. So four to one scaling means that if you rescale here by t to the minus one fourth, if you rescale the space by t to the one half, and this is just one for the time, then you have the analytic law. Just follows immediately from the equation here. Now, if we look at the corresponding correlation, so this is the correlation at time t1 at location x1, t2 and x2 of this process here. Let me go by r uh, ew, for uh, Edward Wilkinson, then there is, this is self-similar. In other words, there is no, there is no, it's easy. You don't have to pass to the limit. You can compute explicitly the aging function. This comes immediately from the scaling property. Let me go back, just plug in this here. Here we just put zero, we just plug in here. And then we use, let me go back, use the formula we were using here. You just plug everything in this and you get immediately where the kappa here you have identified to be one force. You can just plug it and you get exactly this formula here without passing to the limit because everything is, is scaling in there. Now, if you don't rescale the space, okay, then it's easy to see that. Uh, so if you don't rescale the scale, the space, see, 
what you should do, of course, is rescale the scale by t to the one half. But if you don't rescale the scales, then this just is the same as t tends to zero. So the first theorem you have immediately this property here. It's quite easy to see. Now, like I said, this model is a toy model. This is a limiting model. But now let me go to a model which is more interesting, which we call the Ginzburg Landau model. Actually, this should be a Z here, sorry. The Ginzburg Landau model, where you just look at the equation here of, uh, so what you start with is a V. So the function V, we assume it to be strictly convex. Okay, so for instance, just to start with, let's look at the special case where V of X is X square. So what you would pick up here, this here, by the way, is the discrete divergence. So we will define by this discrete gradient is just U of, of J plus one minus U of J, it's just a discrete gradient. So what you pick up here is a discrete divergence. Now, if V would be just the linear one, this would be just a discrete Laplace here. So now we assume that V is uh, strictly convex. So what we pick up here is, is, is an, an equation of this form. And these are just a family of Brownian motion, okay? Now, what is easy about, what is interesting about this model is that you also have stationarity. So station, remember, what, what was the idea of stationarity? Stationarity dealt with the following problem, okay? If increment, space-time increment are stationary. So the space increment is just a gradient. So it turned out that for this model, if you start, this is initial distribution of this form. So we start with a one parameter of product measures. Then it turned out that uh, we have also stationarity. By the way, this is maybe the most, so this is a relatively trivial fact you can do quite easily in one dimension, but it's also true, and this is maybe more interesting in higher dimension. So you can also deal with the Ginzburg-Landau model in higher dimension, in particular, the physical dimension would be two. And you can also prove stationarity. Now, in this business here, we can also look at the uh, corresponding correlation. So this is a correlation of the uh, Ginzburg-Landau model at different time and different location. So this, then, uh, what we find out is the following way. So suppose you start with initial distribution. So initial distribution means that the increment, the space increment are IID with some parameter. Then what you can find out is that as T tends to infinity, the correlation converts to the same, is it in the Wilkinson class? By the way, here you see, I've rescaled the space by square root of T. So in particular, if you do it uh, without scaling, you precisely this. So in some sense, this is attract. You have the same, you have the same uh, aging function. Although you started with a nonlinear model. Okay. Let me just sketch the proof. The first thing you want to make sure is that why uh, you have stationarity for the process. And one way of dealing with this, we look. This is a time-space increment. And let's write down what is the equation for the time space increment. So you just write down what is the, the, the stochastic differential equation of the space time increment. And then what you find out is you can write it in the following way. You start here, so this is the equation, and then you look at the increment. And what you find out is that basically, you write down what is the equation corresponding to this. And and if you write down the, the equation, what you end up having is just, everything is just shifted. In particular, the, the noise is shifted. But of course the noise, but of course the noise uh, itself has the same distribution. This is a basic property. The Brownian motion you put here has the space-time property, shift property. And if it's also known at the beginning, so basically you would just find out that the equation satisfies the same. So here we look at the equation of a space-time increment. And then we will find out that this is just the equation of uh, a space-time increment. So this is used on at time S, and if you look at this, and then you will find out that this has the same law, provided you start correctly at the initial law. This is one, one way of dealing with it. And I want to stress that 
you can also do exactly the same type of uh, business. And this is less trivial in higher dimension, in particular dimension two, because in dimension two, this is important. The initial law will not be IID anymore, but you can still describe it as a stationary state. Now, let me just uh, show uh, how convergence of variance. So for simplicity, so remember in the aging business, there are two basic ingredients. One basic ingredient is to make sure that you are stationary. And the second ingredient is, is how to deal with the, cover, with the variance. And so let me just look at the, I claim that we can compute the variance for this business and let me just for simplicity, just take the linear case. So linear case means, let me go back to the equation here. Linear case, so suppose V prime is just stationary. It means that as an equation, what you will have is just the differential of time is just one half of the discrete Laplacian plus, plus uh, the space white noise. Very simple model. It's a, actually we call it an einstein ulbeck process. So the claim is that for this model, if you start with, with IID increment at the beginning, then you get that the variance at time t and u is just the expectation of a random walk starting at location i of the absolute value of x at time t. And the proof is very simple. So let's have a look at the proof. So this is a stochastic. Here you realize this is a discrete Laplacian. So this is just the equation for the, we want to know how the variance looks like. Starting with this, you just use Ito's formula to get it. It's just the Ito formula. So the differential of the square. So this is, so give a one half your u times the discrete Laplacian plus one. This comes from, from the Brownian motion here and then this. Therefore, if you look just at the uh, PDE for the uh, variance, you see that the derivative of the PDE can be expressed this way. And now comes the basic fact. You see, first of all, of course, you get an equation in terms of covariance, okay? But then, uh, but then what you do is, of course, you use the reduction. So you express the variance the covariance in terms of the variance, because you know it's stationary, and therefore you end up with an autonomous equation for the variance. And this is just the heat equation of the variance. So basically the basic step is how to get from here to here, you're just plugging the variance to covariance form. So here you always have covariance, but you get rid of covariance and you get to variance. And then you see it's exactly the equation of the um, of a heat equation, because here you pick up the, the, uh, the discrete Laplacian, but you started, uh, this is, how, because you have independent increment, this is how you get at the initial value, and this is why you get this formula. Okay, now I come to a more interesting model. And this is just to stress, to tell you that, in fact, this was just, an, I just want to deal with a model for, for which, uh, in fact, uh, you have the variance to covariance formula, but which is not stationary. And the model is just a super random walk. The super random walk basically is about the same as PDE, but instead in front of the Brownian motion, what you pick up here is a square root. So you have here the, the discrete Laplacian, and this is the square root, okay? It's sometimes called the super random walk. And we assume, of course, that we start with non-negative. And now what is more important, we assume that the expectation at time zero is one, identically one. And this is just how you start with the covariance. This is the covariance at, at initial value. Then it turned out that if you look, so this is, this is a difficult equation because here you have square root, but it turned out, this is just by using Ito formula, that the covariance of this model here, this is the super random more, agrees with the covariance of the, uh, the einstein lundbeck process. And in fact, what you exploit is precisely that the expected value is one. So in terms, in the L2 theory are the same. In particular, if of course you start with the same unit. In particular, if you just use this for the, uh, you remember, if you use the, the initial value to, to be in stationary phase, you also will have variance to covariance formula. Now, this was a trivial model, but it can also be dealt with the so-called super Brownian motion. 
Now, super Brownian motion in dimension one has a beautiful property that it has a density. And this is actually the equation for the density. So basically we look, uh, you look at the super Brownian motions here, you have just the, the, the discrete lap, I mean the continuous Laplacian square root of this. So, and this is a space white knot. So you see, this is also looks like the Edward Wilkinson process, but you have it this way here. And here again, this is very important. We started with non-negative with expected value one, and it turned out that you have also, you have also this, the same property for this. So in some sense, super Brownian motion in dimension one will also satisfy exactly the same aging property as this. So it just means because we reduce all the information to the covariance, they are just the same. Okay, I may just one make one comment just to finish the story here. Uh, here, we, we were just dealing with a system, okay, where we were in stationarity. So stationarity, you could go to the variance to covariance formula. But there's another regime, which is, let's call it the narrow edge regime, where, for instance, you assume that the covariance, here I just say bounded, but that would be enough. Uh, but for instance, even zero deterministic. So you, you have at the initial value, you are not so, let me look at the Edward Wilkinson model and we assume that we are not, we are not uh, highly correlated at the beginning, which we needed for the stationarity because it was linear at the difference. Then it turned out that, oh, sorry. Then it turned out that you have another aging property. So suppose we look at this model here at time S and AS and you see, we get another aging function here. So, so the, which is much a bit smaller, but you can do it expected. And it's also true for the super Brownian motion and related discrete model. So in other words, if you are not in a stationary regime, you get also aging, but with a different function. Okay, so this was toy model, just as a warm up. And now we come to the real difficult case. We are now in the KPC universality class. So you might have known that there are a lot of models which properly rescaled are, are getting into the KPZ fixed point regime. And here I have a, a picture, for instance, directed random polymer. And uh, here you have totally asymmetric uh, uh, simple exclusion. Then you have a last passage percolation, polynuclear model, Richardson model, Edwin model, and stochastic variable equation. I mean, there are all, all kinds of equations which are known to, to somehow get into this, I mean, or conjecture to get into this. So let's look at a very special case. And now we come to the, to the business, which is just the, um, the station, but in a very special regime, which is a stationary KPZ equation. So formally, I will just write it in the following way. Now wait. Uh, so we said this is the SPD of the KPZ equation, but starting with Brownian motion. So one way of viewing is this uh, is of course uh, what we're going to, to look at is a Kohlhoff transform. So formally, what you look uh, is a stochastic heat equation, uh, properly rescaled, and then this is just a log of the stochastic heat equation by the famous result of fire. Here we start with what is important. We start with with the uh, with a Brownian motion, double side Brownian motion, which is a so-called stationary regime. Stationary regime means that the gradient formally, which is Berger equation associated with this, is stationary. So the space gradient is stationary. Now let's have a look at the corresponding correlation. So this is the, the correlation, this is put E for KPZ equation at different time and space. And then our first result shows that for every A positive, so we don't rescale the space. If we don't rescale the scale, then as t tends to infinity, this satisfies aging with an explicit aging function. And now you see the difference between what we had before, instead of having one fourth, okay? Here one fourth and one half, we pick up the third, which is precisely what you expect. So we get exactly, uh, the, the, this is a different equation, which comes from the, the scaling property of the KPZ equation. Now, sketch of the proof. The first, so, so we want to prove this. Okay. So the first idea we're going to use is that the KPZ is space-time stationary. So let me go back. This was known to be stationary in time. 
Okay. And now what we're going to prove is that it's space-time stationary. So we're using this. And why do you use this? I will tell you why. Because, I mean, I will show you why it's stationary. The reason is if you want to compute this and you know it's stationary, all right, then you know that you can express the correlation in terms of variance. And then if you know asymptotics or variance, you're done. The reason why we do this is because it's extremely tedious for this model to deal with the two times correlation unless you are in a stationary region. So let me go back to what I said. So th this, this uh, KPZ equation can be seen as a log, as the log of the stochastic heat equation in color transform, okay, with properly escape and normalization. So you look at the stochastic heat equation, but you start with exponential or Brownian motion. And what we claim is, you remember, we claim that this here was space-time space -time, uh, stationary, which because of the log is the same thing as if you look at this, at this fraction, z of t times plus, I mean, the fraction here is the same log. This is just because of the log. So basically we want to prove that this here has the same law as this, which is equivalent. And the next step is the following. Uh, so this, suppose you look at the, state, at, at the KPZ equation, and you see, this is precisely when you started, we started our, our, in the stationary regime, we started uh, with our aging businesses. This is a constant, which is actually not seen from, from the, uh, uh, in the co correlation and uses the scaling factor, then it's known that this will convert to the baked range distribution. Now, the big issue, of course, this, and this was where you have to be very careful. So this was well known. This is already 2015. Why we were stuck for quite some time is the following fact, just knowing this, and you might uh, recall this result, which is a very deep result, is just a result of weak convergence. And it's done usually by using the convergence of the, of the, uh, of the uh, characteristic function. This does not imply the convergence of moment. And this is, this is a tool of force realized by Corbin and Goshal in 2019, which basically showed that not only do you have this weak convergence here, but you have also convergence of moment. In particular, this implies the convergence of variance. Now, let me go to the, I want, maybe I was a bit too fast here. It turned out that this lemma here, okay, which just shows that this, so you have the stochastic heat equation. A, for us, the, why this has the same law as this is exactly the same type of lemma, the proof that I showed you for the Gitzburg model. In other words, you just look at the equation satisfied by this in T for fix S and Y, and you use the explicit solution uh, for this, which is, uh, which you can do by just using the semi-group associated to the left-hand side, to the right-hand side, and you can prove it. This, like I said, is a deep result. And the next thing is, in order, you see, once you poised to look at correlation, you need a convergence of moments, and this is a deep result that we use. Now, let me go to the so-called, I want to stress the fact that, that, this is not, I mean, this is really a convergence. In other words, it's not, it's not self-similar. On the other hand, if you suppose you are in the, already in the so-called KPZ fixed point, which is conjectured to be the convergence of the other process properly rescaled, then you have this for the KPZ fixed point, uh, exactly the self-similar property. And of course, if you have a self-similar property, and it's also nice to see that if you start with uh, double side Brownian motion, then uh, basically for the correlation, you have even immediately without passing to the limit, the KPZ equation, I mean, the, uh, the uh, aging function. And of course, if you don't rescale this, here you see you have to rescale the space. If you don't rescale the space, then you can also prove it here that you have the conversion to this. Now, there are other models where you can deal with this. So this is a model we were dealing with was for the stochastic heat equation, if you wish. The other model, which is a total asymmetric 
simple exclusion, which has also this Ficta symmetry, which has been also proved with this. And the last passage, speculation, which you can map to the task set. Now, so. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So if you're given the aging function, can you get something about the scaling of the process? Because you, you showed one direction, but is the other direction possible? Yes, because otherwise you could use it in both ways, yes. Mm -hmm. But in some sense, uh, what you need is an asymptotic scaling to get it, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so at this point, let's say the result was not particularly surprising, uh, but so, but we wanted actually originally with Amir. Originally with Amir, okay. We started with the following problem here. We looked at the at the. Uh, this was in two, 2006. We look here instead of having minus the discrete gradient, we had the Laplacian discrete Laplacian. This is called the parabolic Anderson model. So in fact, it's called dynamic because on the right hand side here, what you see is the time space noise. This is Brownian motion, okay? So together, let me go back to the very beginning of the talk. I said, we conjecture that we have aging for the log of the solution where instead of having minus discrete gradient, we had the discrete Laplacian. This is still open. The reason is it's still open because we don't know whether we have a stationary distribution for that. On the other hand, let's have another look, which is called the Yor O'Connell model, where you replace a discrete Laplacian with this object here, which is minus the disc, uh, discrete uh, gradient. Now, it turned out that at, in the so-called intermediate regime, so we have the parameter here, which is the noise, which is n to the minus one fourth. Then it is known, this was done, in 2014 by our co-author. I forgot to mention, sorry, that of course what I'm talking about is together with Tal and Moreno Flores. Uh, so Moreno Flores, Remenik and Castell in 2014, and recently also Jaran Moreno and Flores in 2020, realized the following way that if you properly rescale so you have to properly rescale here. You have a small noise regime and you have to tilt. If you look at this, uh, you have, this is a time, this is clear. So you speed up time, but now you tilt on the diagonal because this is Tn. And this is the reason why you have to tilt. You see it because here, you see you have an asymmetry. The asymmetry of this object here just tells you that you keep increasing. So you are just tilting back you're just tilting back the, uh, to get it flat at this place here, but it shows that this converges to the stochastic heat equation. Now, this is again, it's a typical type of result, which is you have different ways of dealing with this, but one way of dealing with this is of course, to look at the corresponding, uh, the corresponding uh, uh, characteristic function. You see, it's not yet telling you, okay, that if you look at the log of this object here, that you can also prove that the L2 moment converges. So in fact, this is a challenge. So let me do it again. Here you know that in distribution, this converts to the stochastic heat equation. So of course, what you know immediately is that the log of Zn converges to the log of Z, which is just a KPZ equation. But this is not yet a convergence of the variance, which you know, which you need in order to prove aging, because you don't have a, the big issue in this business is always the lower bound. The lower bound is a big business. In other words, it's usually you can, you can, if you look at the log, you know, log can diverge in two ways. You can converge because it becomes too large when Zn is too large, okay? Or log can also uh, behave badly because it could be too small if Cn uh, goes to zero. And this was the challenge. And this is what Tal will tell you. Tal will tell you more in his talk because this was a real challenge, how to prove that this guy here basically has convergence also of the moment. And once you have this, then you can get uh, the convergence of this. Okay. 
So let me go now to a couple of open questions. Uh, the first question you can deal with is a higher dimension. So uh, as I told you, if you go to the landau ginzburg model, let me go back to the landau ginzburg model, okay? Then it turned out that uh, you, this, which is, you start with a discrete model, it turned out that you can also prove that the initial distribution that you have stationary, provided the initial distribution is, is the gradient model. Now, there's a big difference with the gradient. So remember, for a process to be stationary, okay, what you basically want to prove is that the, the discrete gradient is stationary. Now, in one dimension, discrete gradient model are quite easy because they are just IID. In high dimension, you always have the loop condition. In particular, what you will find out in dimension uh, higher than one, I many two, and so on, the, the discrete gradient due to the loop condition decays very slowly, like one to the distance to the power d. But still, you can prove that it's stationary. In particular, uh, in, in case d equals two, you can prove for this kind of model that you have the following type of aging. So, you, uh, so we're in dimension two, we're in a stationary regime. We're in a stationary regime. And then uh, you see, before that we, have, we had s plus a times s, so a minus one s, if I look at the notation before, right? But now we just a. Now, in dimension two, basically, we had logarithmic scale. It means that you have, which means that the log of SA is I mean, you logarithmic scale here, or if you would power scale. Then you can do the following way. If A is smaller than one, between zero and one, then the limit as S tends to infinity, the aging function you get at this place, if you fix X and Y, so you don't descale the space, is one minus A divided by two. On the other hand, if A is larger than one, is one half of square root of A. By the way, this is if you are in the stationary regime. You can also, you can also deal uh, with the, uh, uh, not the stationary regime, but the narrow edge regime, then it would just be one minus A. Now, it's, e it's easy to see, and if you find out already with Amir that if you are in the Edward Wilkinson class, if D is larger than three, there is no aging. Okay. So the, let's say even what I'm not sure, I don't know yet how to deal with, uh, this are for discrete model, discrete model. So the discrete model that you get this side of conversion. Of course, you could ask yourself, what about the, what about the continuous model in particular? So of course, it, the continuous model in dimension two, it's not point-wise defined. You see, this is point-wise. So of course, instead of putting X and Y here, you will have to smear a little bit around because of distribution process. But the big issue is how could you possibly describe what is the stationary distribution? And it's not clear how, to, how could, uh, you, you could deal with this. Because let me tell you the following fact. The stationary distribution here for this business here in the, in, the, in, in the harmonic case. So harmonic case is just you put the linear function. So you just put the on standard back process. Then you will find out, so the, the increment, remember it's a gradient model. And you can, so once you know how the increment looks like, you can find out by uh, what is the process. It turned out that it's a Gaussian model with a grid function, which is zero at zero. Uh, if you rescale it in the higher dimension, you see that it makes no sense because the grid function with, with zero bounding condition just at one point, which is polar, does not make sense. So even in the continuous case, it's not clear how to deal with this uh, for, for this business in, in, in the continuous setting. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, so here, even in the continuous case, there's some uh, would be quite interesting. Now, what about the KPC class? And now let's go back to what I did with Amir a long, long time ago. So let's have a look again. So this is, you see, the difference between what I have here and what we had in the model with the Yor O'Connor model in K is that you put a discrete, discrete Laplacian instead of discrete gradient. Now, the first question is, 
do you have a stationary regime? So it turned out this model, okay, you don't have an explicit. So it's not true that if you start with independent increment, even in dimension one, that you are stationary. So the first question is, can you find out what is the stationary regime for this year? On the other hand, what you know is that this properly is scale, this is not too hard. If you put beta n, which is n to the minus one fourth, will also convert to the stochastic heat equation. Now, what we expect here is that uh, if you look at the log of this object here, it should be aging in dimension one and two. And now this comes now the, 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 the challenge. So in dimension two, you also have the problem on how to define it properly. What is stochastic heat equation in dimension two? And the next question is, this is quite striking. It's easy. Let's, there's one business which is very easy. If you choose beta to be small enough, okay, then you will find out that this conversion that let's say uh, that you don't have aging, but if beta is large enough, it's a supercritical regime, then it's not clear what will happen, but you also expect to have aging. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Thank you very much. Yes. Like I said, for, for this talk? Uh, I, I just want to make a remark before we start. Uh, uh, it will turn out that Tal will tell you, will tell us more about the challenge of dealing with the Yorkano model. So he will give you some other stuff. Okay, so any questions for Jean-Dominique? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to expand on Yatal's uh, question. He was asking about um, uh, can it can it be used to prove uh, scaling? So if I if I prove this aging, which seems like a, a covariance relation actually, um, so in, for instance, let's take one of those uh, KP's universality class uh, uh, examples. Then does it actually prove that you converge to this KPZ equation? No. No. Oh, of course. I mean, I want to stress two facts. I mean, first of all. Everything I told uh, you today, okay, was uh, for the stationary regime, okay? And if you want to know more about the non-stationary regime, then you should look at the latest result of Corbin and Hammond, okay, where they are in the narrow range. But of course, uh, as I showed you for the, uh, for the super brown motion, okay, you will see that super brown motion has the same correlation structure, okay? as the onstein unbeck process, if you start, I want to stress, if you start at expectation value is, 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 is one, otherwise things are different. And, and of course, this is, so aging, the way we define aging, it's just one, uh, an L2 type business. So all, all you will get is information about L2, but not about the distribution itself. Ah, uh, I see. Now, so you will get so, so, so indeed, in this example of uh, of uh, super brown motion or super random walks, yes. So, it, so uh, you would get so under under certain. What is the relation between this process that you get to orange and orange? They have the same covariance structure. That's right. right. That's all. But that's all. That's I all. Mean, yeah. So, so, so in, in some sense, you have to be careful. And this is a standard thing what you do when you teach probability, okay? Uh, you know, the standard question, uncorrelated doesn't mean to be independent, okay? Right. Which means you're a little blind. Now, what is surprising in this business is the other way around, which is actually the challenge. I mean, thank you for your question. The challenge was following. There are quite a few models, okay? For which you know, all right, that you have convergence in low which means, and then they deal with this extremely difficult uh, uh, business of, of uh, uh, you know, random matrices and, and, and exotic models or whatever, where they compute very explicitly determinantal process, okay? They compute the asymptotic of the, uh, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, the, I mean, they, they, they compute the Fourier transform, all right? So, so this they can deal with. And there are quite a few models on this, all right? So this is actually a large class of model where you can deal with this. Okay, they're more or less explicit, but there's a class of model where you can prove, okay? 
that the characteristic function converges. And once you know convergence of the characteristic function, you know, of course, that we converge, right? So you'd be surprised, there's quite a last class because the method works. Okay, it's not very robust, but it works. The big challenge in this business is to prove that it's also correct for the L2 moment, right? The L2 yes. moment. And this is very hard. Now, there's one class of models where you can do it quite explicitly. And these are models which are based on, on Gaussian noise. Gaussian noise, there are all kinds yes. of things. It could be as a discrete or continuous. Because once you have Gaussian noise, in other words, uh, the basic technique is concentration. And this is, I hope, what uh, Tal will tell us in a special case. But this model, then you can also prove that the moment, that also the moment converge. But there are quite a few models where you just don't have the technique. So right. in some sense, your question, uh, for, for if you're interested in aging, which, which is looking at things in terms of correlation, then basically, the, the issue is is rather rather the other way around. So the issue is in, in general I don't have Gaussianity, right? So I... that's why right, that's why. Right. Okay, fine. I see. Okay, any any other questions? Okay, so we uh, thank Jan and Link again for a uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. We will. Thank you, and we will reconvene uh, at eleven in uh, six minutes to hear uh, Tal Orenstein more about this subject. Okay.